Well, hi everybody, it's Mrs. Perryman, and I'm glad that you are joining us today. We're gonna to be talking about chocolate, which is one of my favorite subjects. Do you guys like chocolate? Not really. Uh, not really? I like it. You like it? That's good, Jaden. Chocolate has a long history and we're going to we're going to get to that here in just a minute. I wanted to uh, just ask if anybody had uh, is everybody planning on coming back uh, next next semester? We uh, are just kind of need the information if you're planning on going back to your to your high school or if you're planning on not returning if you uh, would kindly let us know that we would appreciate it we certainly don't want to lose anybody and are definitely not encouraging you to do that but we understand that sometimes people have have things that they're sending school that they need to take care of and so we are understanding of that but it uh, makes it much easier on our end if we know that before time there's a little bit of paperwork that we need to fill out and you uh, will uh, will need to collect your book and a few other things so if that applies to you then if you would kind of let kindly let me know you can email me or call me and we can can take care of that but like I said I certainly hope that's not the case with any of you guys we, I'd love to keep you all and hope you're planning to return so I just wanted to have that one little little housekeeping thing to remind you of. Next week, remember that we are just uh, virtual. There will be no in-person classes next week, which is the week of the 14th. And so we will just have our usual Wednesday virtual meeting and you'll have some assignments online. So I'll be looking for those and looking forward to seeing your faces on, on Zoom next week. And we are still planning on returning uh, January 4th uh, for just as the same amount of time that we have had scheduled previously. We are uh, just going to be watching the numbers of people that are having to quarantine and so if that happens to change over the course of the holiday we will let you know and generally when we contact students we do that via remind or through your email or both and so if you're not sure what day that we are going to be starting back or if there's been any change uh, you are free to to text me or call me and I'm happy to give you that information Right now, it appears that it will still be as scheduled on January 4th, but that could change. So a little closer to that time, we may have some more information. So any questions about that so far? No. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen with you right here we're going to talk about chocolate mm, looks so good right. so who so anthony you're not a not a chocolate fan is that what you said yep okay but Jaden, you are is that right Yep. Okay. Well, that's that's good. So there's there's you know it's a big world out there. So there there is there's room for everybody, chocolate lovers and non chocolate lovers. So I happen to fall into the the chocolate lover category. And so and it is it is a pretty pretty common thing that we use in the kitchen. It turns up in lots of different kinds of recipes. And so it's something that we as culinarians need to be familiar with the different kinds of chocolate and the different uses and processes of using chocolate. So I thought it might be fun, a little bit fun to kind of learn about the history of chocolate and then the actual process of chocolate. 
to make to make a bar of chocolate like we like we know it today it really does take quite a while and it requires some uh, pretty heavy duty equipment and some pretty pretty long like I said processes so out on Moodle I put I think there's a couple of videos that I ended up putting I think two on there that talk about the the different processes of making chocolate. There's one on there about Hershey's chocolate, which is that world famous Hershey bar that's been around since the late 1800s. And then there's also another one that just talks about the process of chocolate. So I hope you'll find those interesting. The um, cacao pod or, or uh, yeah, I guess it's a pod, is actually native to the Americas. And actually, um, the, the trade of chocolate really didn't begin until the explorers around 1400, kind of the late 1400s, came to, to uh, what was the present day, or the, the then day, rather, Mayan culture, which, were, which was in Mexico. And they they were greeted by the Mayan people, and they discovered this drink that was made from it was fermented cacao from that pod, and it was nothing like like chocolate like we know it. It's a it was a bitter tasting. They fermented it so it had a, had a kind of a I'm sure a smell to it, and it was somewhat frothy. And they, it was reserved really for special occasions and for, for special people and events. It was uh, considered to be quite valuable. The, the pods, inside those big pods, there are beans and the beans were dried and actually used as money or traded for things. So like I said, they were very, very valuable, but Again, the chocolate like we know it, after it after the the explorers took it back to to Europe with them, the uh, the beans they started kind of playing around with that that uh, liquid concoction that they had had from the Mayans and discovered that if they added sugar to it and um, a few other things, they would have something some version of what we probably know today as hot chocolate, which is pretty good stuff. So um, it became very fashionable and in, in during that time to drink hot chocolate in a lot of homes, the well-to-do people there might have, have a, a porcelain chocolate set that they could drink uh, from a, a chocolate pot which would be similar to a teapot uh, and dainty little uh, porcelain uh, cups, like tea cups, but they were for hot chocolate. And it became quite fashionable to, to drink hot cocoa. Well, here's the process of making chocolate. And as I mentioned earlier, it is a very long process. It's very labor intensive. The, um, the cacao trees grow, grow near the equator and it's pretty fairly hot there. Um, in the pods that, that I think you can see a picture of one down here in the bottom, they, they don't fall off of the tree like we see like with ripe fruit, for instance. And so they have to be harvested by hand, all of them. And so that's pretty uh, labor intensive work because they use a machete to chop them off the tree and then the pods are thrown uh, into a, a big bin and then they're hauled wherever it is that they need to, to take them. And so again, it's, it's a pretty hands-on labor intensive process. Um, Acres upon acres of land are cleared to to grow cacao trees, and you know you probably have heard about um, the losing you know the rainforest areas and of all of the uh, vegetation that is cleared and how that's impacting the environment. Have you guys heard of that before? Not yet. 
Okay, well, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big issue now. And so those cacao plantations um, are, are uh, cutting down trees and vegetation that would be really um, essential uh, for our rainforest. And so, so a little bit of the, the chocolate making industry has kind of a, a dark history. Um, those, whenever we talked about like those early days where the Europeans decided that it was it was quite tasty, those big plantations where I told you that it was um, quite labor intensive, they would take slaves and, and the, the uh, picking of the, the pods will be done by slave labor. And that was around the equator uh, in the southern uh, southern uh, part of South America. Um, and then that they decided instead of taking the the slaves to the um, to where it was growing, they decided to start growing the the cacao trees where the slaves were. And so or along the Ivory Coast in Africa, the the plantations started moving there, and they still used slave labor. And even today, um, this industry kind of has a has a bad name because they employ oftentimes child labor and uh, some pretty uh, unhealthy uh, working conditions. And so we really have to be aware of the things that we're purchasing and who we're purchasing them from and uh, under what conditions the people that are working there uh, are having to deal with. And so so there's, there's a lot more to it than just just buying buying a chocolate bar so anyway just kind of wanted to um just to uh, let you know about some issues that, that could be uh, uh associated with with chocolate okay so anyway but on to you on to the process of making chocolate once the 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 pods are picked they like i said before they're removed by hand from the tree um, and then they're cracked open, usually by hand also. And inside is, is like a white, fluffy kind of a, a seed. And you can kind of see it right here. And it looks to me, it looks kind of like marshmallow. And those, those um, seeds are pretty good size inside. And they're probably a little bigger than an almond. And they are taken out and they're white. They're white. And whenever they come come out, they are put into just a, a big container and they're a little bit moist and they're allowed to ferment. And so uh, they, they kind of begin to break down a little bit. And once that, there's a, a set number of days, I really don't know what it is, but once that fer they fermented long enough, then they are, they're dumped out of that container just onto a, uh, just a, a dry ground area and they're allowed, they're just kind of raked out and they're allowed to dry in the sun for a set amount of time until they reach a certain uh, dryness. I don't know, there should be a, probably a technical term for that. I'm not sure what it is. And then once they are sufficiently dried, then they are taken to a machine and they're cracked. And they, they're cracked kind of like we would crack like a pecan, for instance, how the outside has a shell and then the meat is on the inside. And this is kind of that same process. They're crushed and the shell is removed. And what's left inside is called a nib, N-I-B. And because of that nib, that's that's where the, the beginning of this chocolate process begins. And those nibs are crushed. And from that crushed nib, we, we get the chocolate liquor and cocoa butter. And those are separated, okay? And then in, um, in that process, um, if we wanted, if we want to sweeten it, like for a for a candy bar, for instance, we would add sugar at that point. And if we're making, for instance, milk chocolate, we would add milk to it. And then the solid part that's extruded um, would be ground up into things like cocoa powder, which which we use to make cakes. 
um, or sometimes we'll sweeten it and use it to make a, a powdered hot chocolate. Okay. Okay, so here's kind of a, a picture of, of the process here. So you've got the, the cocoa tree that grows the pod and then the pods are picked off of the tree and then they're cracked open and the beans are pulled out and they're allowed to ferment for a few days and then they're dried and then crushed and the cocoa nib uh, and the shell are separated and then the nibs are crushed and then that's where we get the cocoa butter and the cocoa uh, liquor and then as you see how it kind of goes out those cocoa solids we're going to get the cocoa powder and then the cocoa butter over here on the right and that's where we get the different kinds of of chocolate which is kind of interesting you know um i i know there's there's different kinds of chocolate but i didn't really realize what made them what made them different so for instance you guys have probably seen uh baking chocolate before we have them in uh, they're just in boxes and we use them we melt them sometimes we'll make different kinds of cakes do you guys know what i'm talking about yes yeah, so they're, most of the time you'll see those, they're unsweetened, although you can buy those sweetened. But baking chocolate typically would be dark chocolate and, and no sugar and no milk. And so sometimes you'll see bittersweet or semi-sweet. I was thinking about that, like for, like for chocolate chip cookies, for instance. A lot of times recipes will call for semi-sweet chocolate. Or sometimes you'll see um, baking chocolate in the bittersweet uh, variety. And those two actually have extra cocoa butter added, which when you think about it would cause it to, to melt a little bit uh, more easily. Okay, milk chocolate, good old milk chocolate, that is the number one eating chocolate. So that's like your 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 Hershey bar for instance, which is so creamy and delicious. Okay. And then there's cocoa, which is if you look over here uh, on this on the side uh, of this slide, this cocoa powder here, that's the remains after the cocoa butter is removed. Okay, and that's cocoa powder. And so the difference between cocoa powder and Dutch cocoa powder is um, an alkalization process. So cocoa powder, um, you'll see uh, pretty often, sometimes you'll see right on the package, like on, for instance, Hershey's cocoa powder, you'll see it says Dutch. And what that means is they've added this alkalizing agent to it, which kind of gives it a darker, richer, chocolatey color like like we expect it to be it enhances the the chocolate flavor um, and it also causes it um, sometimes you'll see it like in cocoa drinks like hot chocolate and it'll say dutch and and what that does is it helps that uh, dissolve in in the milk a little more readily and so you get a smoother a smoother taste and mouthfeel of it the other, the other versions of chocolate that you might see are almond bark. Have you ever heard of almond bark before, guys? Um, no. Okay. Well, you'll see um, a real, really about this time of year, usually around Christmas time, you'll see lots of homemade candies and things like that. People like to make nut clusters and different kinds of things and you'll see something called almond bark set out in the grocery store and almond bark is what would be we would classify as candy coating or chocolate flavored candy coating okay and it's a blend of this cocoa powder over here and a little bit of the cocoa fat and a lot more of the uh, vegetable oil and so it's a lesser quality uh, chocolate product and so it it um, melts beautifully but it is not high the highest quality of chocolate okay 
so, um, but it does really nice if you're making homemade chocolates and things like that. It's very nice for that. And it's also less expensive than, than say, trying to buy semi-sweet chocolate and things like that. And you guys have probably heard of white chocolate before, haven't you? Yep. Yep. Anthony, do you like white chocolate? I actually hate that more than, you know, chocolate. Really? Okay. Well, just, just curious there. White chocolate is, is actually, it's cocoa butter and milk and sugar. And honestly, it's, it's not really chocolate at all because there's no chocolate solid. So it's cocoa butter and milk and sugar. And so it, it uh, doesn't have the, the dark color that we associate with chocolate. It, it can be uh, kind of a creamy white and may even range to kind of an ivory golden color. And you'll see it turn up in, in different types of what we call confections or candies. Uh, even even white chocolate candy bars, you'll see you'll see them too. So they are uh, there are lots of different versions of chocolate. So I thought that was kind of uh, interesting how it went from the pod, which does not taste very good at all, down here to the different versions of chocolate, which we see in tasty candies. Okay. So the way that we store chocolate can, can really affect the quality of chocolate. We shouldn't store it in the refrigerator. Anybody ever opened up a, a bar of chocolate and it looked kind of, kind of white or like it had kind of a powdery residue on it? Have you ever noticed that before? Yes, okay. I have it. Okay. So doing things like storing it in the refrigerator or freezer or allowing it to melt or letting it get too hot um, will cause what, um, what is known as bloom. And you can see down here how it's kind of discolored and up here how it's kind of discolored. And it's just a white kind of a, a coating. It looks, like I said, kind of powdery. And what has happened is the... It has melted or um, the it is either melted or some moisture has been allowed to con condense on the surface of the, the chocolate and it, it just doesn't look very pretty it doesn't really affect the quality of the chocolate but the eye appeal of the the shininess of it uh, is lost and so when you think about things like chocolates and candies for instance they are designed to be beautiful and have lots of eye appeal and also to be tasty. And so it's really important that they have a nice visual quality. So, so keeping those things at a nice cool temperature and make sure they stay dry and um, uh, keep them out of moisture. Okay, the way that we use chocolate, whenever, if you're gonna make some homemade candy or something like that, is uh, something that we call tempering chocolate. So here, sometimes if we melt chocolate, I will ask you to, to melt it in the microwave and I tell you, you know, maybe just do it 30 seconds and stir it because chocolate will continue to heat even though you're, you've taken it out of the microwave and it melts at a, a pretty low temperature. Okay, but it does have a couple of different kinds of fat in the chocolate, and both of those fats melt at different temperatures. And so we want to do want to melt chocolate gradually instead of getting it too hot too fast. And using this tempering process, we'll get a nice end product where it will be uh, shiny. If you get it too hot, it will it will seize up and burn and does not taste good. And so we have to be really careful with that. Okay, so tempering chocolate. Here's a little bit uh, more of a process. So if you're making uh, uh, homemade candies, for instance, this might be something that would be some good information to have. There are little tempering 
containers that will actually do this for you. And um, it kind of just keeps it melted at um, the perfect temperature. One of the things you want to be careful with if you're melting it on stove top, you want to make sure that you don't splash any water in it or let the steam from your double boiler um, get into the chocolate because it will, will make it uh, have a strange mouthfeel kind of grainy. Okay, and we'll go back here to this one. Okay, chocolate, just FYI, has some health benefits too. What do you think about that? You need a candy bar, Jaden, and think you're being healthy? Sometimes. <laughs> okay, well, chocolate, maybe in the form of a Snicker bar, probably isn't too healthy, but in the form of dark chocolate, it is fairly healthy. So cocoa contains a chemical called a flavanol. Flavanols help to protect the heart and they help to relax blood vessels, which improves blood flow and that in turn lowers blood pressure. So that's, that's a good thing. And it also, we're finding helps to reduce inflammation. And so that seems to be a big problem with people that have different types of diseases. So, so maybe chocolate, maybe a little chocolate every day is a good thing. We find that dark chocolate contains two to three times more of those flavanol rich cocoa solids than milk chocolate does. So the darker chocolate is more healthful than milk chocolate. And flavonoids can help folks with, um, that are uh, worried about their insulin levels and could possibly reduce the risk of diabetes if they're taken, if it's taken as directed. So the, the prescribed amount for, for this dark chocolate is about six grams per day, which is one or two small little uh, squares per day. And you should choose the kind that are 70% uh, cocoa solids, dark chocolate. And you can buy those at the grocery store sometimes if you see where the, where the candy bars are all lined up. You'll see the different kinds of, of percentages of chocolate there. And it's 70% or higher is supposed to be more healthful. So 70% cocoa solids, uh, which... Uh, like I said, is dark chocolate. And uh, something to consider though, the reason why they only want you to have a couple of small squares per day is because uh, chocolate is high in calories, 150 to 170 calories per ounce. So, so pretty high in calorie, but it does have some benefits. So if we use that with some, some sensibility. It could be a pretty nice little treat. And we could also be doing something helpful for us. So what do you think about that, guys? Pretty neat. Cause I, I kind of, I kind of uh, like dark chocolate because of that kind of reason. It's like one of the most ones I can tolerate. Yeah, okay. Well, that that is good to know, Anthony. Uh, thanks for sharing that with us because because, you know, I love chocolate and I always just assume everybody else does too. But there are, and you know, there's people that are allergic to chocolate too. And so those are things to think about, you know, as a culinarian, you have to consider, consider all, all people and people that might be eating your food. And, and are there any health concerns or anybody that is unable to eat a certain kind of food? So we do have to, to be considerate of all, all, all needs. Well, do you guys have any questions or anything that you would like to know today? I did want to know, did we have a uh, online work last week? I didn't work, put an extra, it? I didn't put another assignment on there. Although I did put two, like I said, those two videos and so if you'll watch those, you will be up to date on chocolate. Okay. 
Okay, and then next week, next Wednesday, I will have an assignment for you on there that we're kind of in, kind of in the limbo right now. There were, what was on there before was, there was some chocolate assignment and there were a few, um, I think it was a couple of um, miscellaneous dessert items on there. But if you've done that, then you are good to go. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, then I'm looking forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. And I hope you're having a good Wednesday. And I will we'll see you soon.